afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. Excellent. Uh, my name is Maya Roy. I am from Canada. I am the CEO of YWCA Canada. So we're a women's NGO and we work with women and girls. Um, and one of the things that we do is we work with survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation. I would like to welcome all of you here today, both in our audience and also watching the live stream for our open forum on ending modern slavery. We have a very distinguished panel here with us this afternoon um, who I will be introducing shortly. So with us here we have Dr. James Cocaine. Um, he comes to us from the UN University where he works, uh, he's the director of policy research. We have uh, over here sitting uh, Sophie Otiende, who comes to us from a number of grassroots organizations based in Kenya. She is an advocate who does a lot of work on the ground, and she will be telling us a little bit about her work. Um, here we have Nina Shala. Um, she is a global shaper and also a professor of law. Uh, in, in Kosovo. And here, last but not least, we have Sir Wainwright, who comes to us from law enforcement. So welcome. I'll have actually each of you, uh, as we start, um, to tell the audience a little bit about yourself and your work. Um, one of the things that I think we're very much interested in exploring today as we're here in Davos um, is what does it mean for different stakeholders to actually address and end modern slavery. So when we're talking about modern slavery, there's different ways of defining it. And I'd very much like for each of our panelists to actually bring your individual expertise and what you've seen on the ground. What works? What, what doesn't work? Um, and what are some of the challenges and, and the solutions that you're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Another thing that we'll be doing here today is actually exploring as an audience, what does collective action look like? How can we make change as community members, whether we're students, whether we're parents, and whether we are policymakers? So I'm going to throw it over. Um, we talked a little bit about the st statistics. Uh, one of the things, Dr. Cocaine, that you have an expertise is, is around uh, mining big data and the importance of data to point us towards evidence-based solutions around addressing, um, addressing some of the issues we'll be talking about today. So over to you. Well, thank you, Maya, and thank you, everybody, for coming and, and being here today. It's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished panel and with all of you to talk about how we can all go about ending modern slavery and what the role, what role we all have in, in achieving that. I'm so glad you started, Maya, with this exercise uh, of uh, giving people a sense of the scale of the problem and how it's distributed. So we saw a number at the beginning. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, estimates that there are about 40 million people in modern slavery worldwide. So that's about one in every 185 to 200 people. I think there are roughly 250, maybe 300 people watching in this hall and in, a, in an adjacent room. If you think about that, what that means and what we mean by modern slavery is that essentially we would treat one person or one and a half people out of all of you as though we owned you. So when everybody else leaves at the end of this lovely panel, whether that person left would depend on whoever is exploiting them, what that person said, for example. This is all about exploitation of vulnerable people. And I'm so glad, Maya, you started with this point about power. People may be vulnerable all over the world for a range of different reasons, and we'll have a look in a minute at what we know about who is vulnerable and why. But I just wanted to start with that number, one in 100 and every 185, if you think about the scale of the problem, that's pretty significant. Now, a few years ago, every country on Earth, 193 countries, agreed to take steps to try and bring that number to zero by the end of 2030. So just a little bit more mathematics. If we divide the 40 million by the number of days left between now and the end of 2030, it means we would need to reduce the number of people affected by 10,000 every single day. 
between now and the end of 2030. So you're probably going to next ask me, you're thinking, well, OK, is that a big number? Is that a small number? How are we doing at the moment? I have the privilege of leading a project at the UN which tries to measure our progress towards that target. And we've been doing this for several years. And I can say with fairly high confidence, we're nowhere near that target of 10,000. So we need all collectively to think about how we can rapidly scale up our efforts to reduce that number uh, to a more manageable number or eventually to zero. So you might say to me, well, if the numbers are so big, where are these people actually? Why don't we see them? And the, the answer there is that if we know where to look, modern slavery is actually so present in our world that it is visible from space. So what you see here is a satellite image of two brick kilns, one at the top, one at the bottom of the screen. These are giant ovens where people are held in debt bondage that Maya referred to, which means that they may be being paid, but they're also, they've incurred a debt for the privilege of working in the awful, dusty, hot, dangerous conditions of carrying dirt and mud into a brick kiln and then staying there while it's baked into bricks. And this is quite prevalent still in South Asia, for example. So what researchers have begun to do is recognize this distinctive pattern of the brick kiln, what it looks like, and train artificial intelligence to trawl across satellite imagery and then map the results. Because if we, not every brick kiln is a site of debt bondage or modern slavery, but you're much more likely to be in debt bondage or modern slavery if you work on a brick kiln than if you work in many other work sites. So finding the brick kilns improves our ability to bring resources and help to the people who are enslaved in those workplaces. And that same technique, using artificial intelligence to examine uh, satellite imagery, is now being used to find sites of slavery in the Amazon, where illegal de deforestation leads to charcoal kilns. Those charcoal kilns make pig iron that is then used to make steel that goes, for example, into cars. So maybe some of the cars, when you go out, out the door, maybe they've been manufactured in part with slavery. The same technique has found slavery in the strawberry fields of Greece, where migrants from North Africa and the Middle East are being forced into labor uh, to pick strawberries for European consumer markets. That's the reality of our global markets today, that often right at the bottom of the supply chain or the value chain, there are people who are being forced to take risks, forced to labor in ways that they uh, otherwise wouldn't want to. So let's go back up to the macro level. Where is the biggest problem? Well, the best data we have is from the International Labor Organization, and you see it here. And you'll notice it's at a regional level, not at a country level, because the best data we have, the most rigorous that's available worldwide, gives us regional outcomes. Now, the highest rate of modern slavery is in Africa and Asia Pacific, uh, and that's why they're darkest. And by modern slavery here, we mean forced labor, including forced labor in the sex trade, but also in other trades, and forced marriage. If we take forced marriage out of the picture for a moment and focus only on the forced labor, that's what the bubbles represent. And you'll see there that the largest bubble is actually in the Asia Pacific. That's the picture for adults. What about for children, who Maya helpfully emphasized at the beginning? Well, this is the prevalence rate by region for children. 152 million children are in child labor worldwide, often in the same kinds of industries we talked about or, for example, in mining mica, the, the glitter that goes into glittery car paint, or indeed, perhaps, into some of your cosmetics. Let's go back to bricks and mortar for a second. If I can get the video to work, what you're seeing here is a visualization of the growth of cities in the last few decades. You'll notice how much they grow, particularly in Asia Pacific. In China in the last 40 years, more people have moved to cities 
than live in cities in all of Europe. Now that rapid urbanization, of course, has a massive ecological footprint, but it also has a significant modern slavery footprint. Because urbanization means construction, and construction means demand for low-skilled workers, particularly men. So people are drawn to these jobs from the countryside or across borders, and as a result, they're very vulnerable along the way, vulnerable to corrupt officials who are forcing them to pay bribes to cross borders, corrupt labor brokers, and criminal employers. So construction is 13% of the global economy, but it's 18% of the world's modern slavery problem, by the best estimates. Now, urbanization is not all a bad story. If you move to a city, your life expectancy improves, in part because your income improves and probably your consumption improves. But in fact, consumption also leads to new modern slavery risks. Let's have a look at an example of this. So this is a visualization of the global trade in fish. The fish trade is worth about $1.4 billion worldwide. Every dot, every single dot in this visualization is $1 million of, of fish being traded. And you'll see, again, that's grown a lot in the last few decades, in particular exports from the Asia Pacific. We now have about 4.6 million vessels fishing for us worldwide, fishing for us, and I would emphasize fishing for our cats and dogs, because often that fish, for example, goes into our pet food. Many of those people are fishing far away from the shore in very isolated, harsh and dangerous conditions. Many of them are migrants. So in agriculture and fishing worldwide, we see annually 1.8 million cases of forced labor and modern slavery. So if you're eating seafood tonight, or if you're feeding your, your animal pet food, just have a think about where that came from and whether it's slavery free. Another good example is the palm oil trade. Many of you may not have heard of palm oil, but it's actually very ubiquitous. It's a product used in everything these days from shampoo to chocolate, although I don't know if it makes its way into Swiss chocolate. We'd have to ask some locals. <laughs> the palm oil trade has also grown, you see here significantly in the last few decades. Palm is grown on plantations where often children are employed and where we see many indications of uh, modern slavery, debt bondage, forced labor. Indications such as people's passports being withheld so that they can't leave when they want to, or their wages being withheld. Concerns about these violations recently led Norway's sovereign wealth fund, its investment fund from the income it gets from petroleum and gas, which is the largest such in the world. It's worth one trillion US dollars. It divested from 33 palm oil companies because of concerns about this kind of violation. And also, uh, very soon after that, US banks followed suit and divested from many of those companies as well. So what we see here is that modern slavery is, in a sense, like climate change, a market failure. With climate change, we are not correctly pricing our production because we're not taking to, into account the effects of that carbon on our lives and on the economy in the long term. There's a lot of discussion of that here in Davos this week. Same story with modern slavery. We're not correctly pricing these labor practices. We think that, this, that the costs fall all on the people at the bottom end of our supply chains. Not true. Recent UK government research suggests the cost in the UK just to the public purse is 330,000 pounds, about $400,000, give or take. Just the direct costs. So looking after these people, prosecuting their exploiters, healthcare. We're not even talking about the loss to the economy from the fact that during their exploitation, these people aren't saving. They're not out on the high street purchasing jeans like you or me. They're not participating as active agents. So the true cost to all of us is actually quite big. The UK government thinks they have about 13,000 people in modern slavery in the UK. 330,000 pounds per person. Immediately you see, back to the maths, I'm sorry to say, 
very big numbers involved here that we're not pricing into the way we organize our production, our consumption, our investment and our lending. And that's why we all need to be thinking about what our role is when we're buying the pet food, when we're putting our money in a pension fund, where is that money being invested? Are we unwittingly supporting practices that lead to modern slavery and human trafficking? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I find it really interesting because usually as economists, we, we tend to think of things in, in one or two variables, but what you're actually pointing out based on the data um, is we can't afford to not act. So as much as, yes, certain companies or consumers benefit from lower prices of goods, um, fr from the so-called cost savings, you're actually pointing out that, that it's an expense we can't afford That's as right. a society. That's right. Yeah. We've heard a lot of talk here in Davos about what are the costs for business going to be if they have to deal with a carbon tax? What would the cost be if they had to you know, really look down to the 13th or 14th tier of the supply chain and find these risky practices? That's the wrong question. The question we should be asking is what price are we paying now and what price will we pay in the future if we don't make that investment to address these mm -hmm. issues before they arise? Wonderful, thank you. So in terms of uh, moving on in the theme of asking tough questions, um, I, I was very pleased to be able to speak with Sophie Otiende, um, who's done a lot of work as an advocate with HEART, which is Awareness Against Human Trafficking. Um, and she is also the incoming Africa Region Operations Manager for Liberty Shared. Um, Sophie, I, when I went on the HEART website yesterday, I was very impressed with the level of research and, and resources. Uh, and what really struck me was the toolkit that I saw around how to recognize uh, modern slavery and trafficking on the ground. In, in terms of your work and your experience, um, we started with the big picture, the, the global statistics. Um, what does it look like for you on the ground as an advocate? Uh, thank you so much, Maya. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dins. Uh, it's always interesting to hear those numbers from like a big level, and then to think about like at my level, those numbers actually mean faces. Mm -hmm. So when you say 40 million, Absolutely. I I can recognize different faces that I can attach to different industries. So I think for me the most important thing again. And I'm glad you spoke about like the cost. And for me, it's always as a survivor, as an advocate, it always breaks my heart when I hear that the only way we can get people to care is once we start thinking about the money. Mm. Like who's losing money, who's not, who's losing money, who's gaining money. And it just shows how much we don't care, for lack of a better word, how much we don't care about like the human element of this, because people are suffering, lives are being lost. If you think about the trauma that people go through, and we, there's the money that businesses, there's the money that government lose, but there's the pain of recovery, which those of us in frontline work have to constantly deal with. And I think for me, it's to think about, not just right now, but to think about also historically. The truth is, we live in a world which was built on people suffering. Mm. And we've sort of come up with a system where for us to get better things, there has to be a human cost, there has, there, there has to be people who pay a price. Mm. And it's people. Lives have to be lost so that other people, other people enjoy. And for me, that's so, it's so unfortunate because the ethics of this at a human level is so sad. Someone, a child in Africa has to die so that someone has a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. A child in Asia has to die so that you put on the next fancy dress. So for me, that's, that's sad. At a grassroots level, Half the time when people talk again, talk about like survivors and talk about like uh, victims of trafficking, there's this othering where we see them as apart from us 
rather than one of us. And I'm glad that you actually did that exercise because the people that suffer, the people that pay the price, are human beings. They have the same desires to wake up in the morning and just take care of their families. Mm. But what ends up happening is that someone is actually deceived and they end up in a situation that they are. For me, human tra we can't we can't talk about, I can't emphasize that they, we've created an ecosystem that basically requires the blood of people to be shed for us to survive. So it's survival for the fittest. You are talking about power. It's a question of who's most powerful and they get to survive and the rest of everybody else gets to pay that price and literally pay that price, you know, die so that we can enjoy luxuries. Uh, I think uh, the now, I, I like that we are moving towards like looking at evidence, looking at how we can fix this, especially using data and asking ourselves, how can I contribute? How can I make a, a difference? And all of us for trafficking, for forced labor to, to end, all of us, the truth is, in most cases, you can tell people that this is not going to cost you a price. The truth is, this will cost us a price. All of us have to be a little bit less selfish for trafficking to end. There's no other way to do it. We have to be a bit less selfish than we've been operating for us to actually do it, to actually get ahead. It's an, again, trafficking doesn't exist independently of other issues. When you look at the places that uh, he's talking about, Africa, Southeast Asia, we all know some of the issues that are there. You're talking about gender-based, uh, places where gender-based violence is prevalent. So you can't fix human trafficking without thinking about issues like gender-based violence. 90% of the victims that I take, take care of, survivors that I take care of, are survivors of child sexual exploitation and are survivors of gender-based violence. You can't talk about trafficking and, talk, and not talk about land rights. The companies that are basically uh, working on plantations and everything, where did they get that land from? Who's losing that land? Why are they losing that land? So you can't talk about trafficking and not talk about land rights. You can't talk about trafficking and not talk about, as you said, not talk about money. Where's the money going? Where are the banks? Who's holding on that money? How is that money flowing within the market? You can't talk about trafficking and not talk about obvious inequality like in the system. So the truth is, if we are to deal, and that's the reason why trafficking is so hard, it's so complex, is that it's connected to so many other issues. And even on the ground, if I, when I work with a survivor, I will have to think about if a woman who's lost her land because basically the family of their husband thought she wasn't good enough to inherit land. I'll have to think about the fact that she has five children and we live in a, probably she lives in a country that doesn't offer social protection. So she doesn't have health care. So I would have to fix that. So it's looking at the whole, the broad picture. And the broad picture includes all of us. So I really appreciate, Sophie, how you're bringing in that intersectional analysis. Um, and, and giving life to the data. Uh, I once worked with a young woman who um, was being sexually exploited and trafficked, but her family had come from Bangladesh to Canada wow. because of climate change, mm -hmm. and then was being pushed into a forced marriage. Um, and you could see how that structural poverty, the migration, um, falling through the cracks of the Canadian system and, and, and the immigration system, how all of those layers Added, um, added on to what ended up to be just the gross human rights violations. Um, Dr. Nida Shah La, um, you've had uh, an impressive career as a lawyer and as an activist and a law professor. Um, and you've also worked as a prosecutor. So it was very interesting for me uh, when we were chatting earlier that you have also taken initiative on your own through the Global Shapers Program to actually create a hub and actually look at some of the prevention pieces and education and life skills uh, around uh, supporting prevention work in, in your country. 
tell us a little bit more. Thanks, Maya. Just one small clarification. Oh, I'm sorry. Not Please. a professor, lecturer. Still, oh, lecturer. I'm so to, sorry. To, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I apologize. My way up the career we academics. Uh, yeah. oh. Maya, I'm very optimistic today, I have to say, because I didn't expect that at Davos, we'd, on a topic on ending uh, mm -hmm. modern slavery, would have an audience which actually consists, I'd say, 75% of youth. This is amazing. This means that you actually care. I can tell because I was actually, I'm, my background is a bit, I'm from, I was born in Pristina. And you know Pristina and Kosovo, most certainly you've heard about the war in the Balkans. So when I was 10, uh, my family was forcefully deported from the country. And I grew up in Tirana. Uh, I've had the chance actually to study in good universities, to get a good education, to work internationally, to work in international organizations. But I felt the necessity to go back to my country and to see if I can actually change things or improve something. So you've heard most certainly about the, the network of the Global Shapers. And the Global Shapers is actually youth who wants, who is actively engaged to uh, promote positive things or to address pressing issues in in our community, in, their, in, in whichever communities they live. So I returned back to uh, Tirana as an advisor to the Minister of Interior. I worked there for a year and noticed the huge problems of youth in, in, in the country. I mean, it's not Albania, it's not just Kosovo, it's Western Balkans in general. So if, you, if one looks at the statistics, there's around roughly 50% of the population is actually youth. Mm. However, around 25% of youth uh, is inactive. So it's out of the education system, out of the employment system, out of, it's like out of the, it's out of the specter of the data as well. Huh? Uh, so uh, what I felt that it, I mean, modern slavery we should, I, I think that what we need to look at when we talk about modern slavery is actually to go to the root causes mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And if we see the root causes, I mean, modern slavery breeds on poverty, breeds on discrimination, breeds on uh, persons without possibilities actually for, for, for uh, to, to, to be part, to be active citizens or to be part of the society. So that's why I actually even, that, that's one of the reasons why I, I decided to found the Global Shapers community in Tirana and bring together young uh, Albanians who were interested in discussion, in discussing these hard topics because this is not a simple topic. This is not something that can be solved very easily. Just like, just like issues of unemployment, just like issues of uh, poverty, just all like issues of inclusion and equality, which for which we've been talking a lot over these days uh, uh, here. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Cocaine mentioned statistics about uh, slaves in the UK. Uh, just a couple of years ago, the highest, like the in the data of the slaves, one of the highest numbers in terms of the nationalities of persons being prone to mo falling prone to modern slavery were actually Albanians. Uh, it's something that touches me, so that's why, and it touches our community as well. And we very much, and I believe that it's very much linked to uh, to, to, to the main major problem of human trafficking that we have as a region, I'd say, not only Albania. So that's why uh, a way how I, I, I found a way to, 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 to address the issue of trafficking, of modern slavery, especially in terms of uh, Albania, by, uh, by talking, by talking to young people, by uh, trying to reform the education system in our country, 
by uh, understanding what are the, 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 the global movements, what, are, what is happening at a global level. We talked about, I mean, here at Davos, we, we've been talking about reskilling and upskilling and the, necessi and the necessity to be, uh, to be on top when it comes also with developments that technology is bringing. So uh, what I've been basically doing this last couple of months, we've been actually holding uh, trainings and holding discussions uh, with kids in, in mm. schools. And we still, we don't have statistic data. We don't know exactly how much we are really mm -hmm. affecting or how much, but I believe that starting from the bottom and working at the community level by raising awareness, by uh, increasing visibility about the phenomenon just by talking about it, uh, and by giving skills which maybe will be helpful to, to, to young people to get into the workforce can be actually a way to, to play a role in, in, uh, in, in tackling such a huge problem. It's, it's really incredible how we're seeing the uses of uh, AI and satellite technology, survivor-led activism. You're using community development you know, as a strategy. All of these strategies peeling back some of the layers of, of what's a really complex issue. Um, I wanted to, mo to move to Sir Robert Wainwright. Um, he comes to us as a partner of the firm Deloitte, but also has had a long career in law enforcement through Europol. What were some of the challenges that you saw? I think as, as a general public, as a, as a lay person, we tend to think of these issues uh, whether it's trafficking or exploitation through, you know, films like Taken or, or, or whatnot. Uh, what were some of the challenges that you saw on the ground and needed policies and, and interventions? I think the, the, the dimension that I, I saw through most part of my career was how organized crime is really cashed in on this trade and has become, of course, a major feature of, of the problem. The growth of sophisticated organized crime syndicates across the globe <coughs> in the way that they have professionalized the business of exploiting men, women, and children, either for sexual exploitation or labor exploitation. Become big business, you know, you hear the numbers um, um, today, and, and what's driving that in the main is, is greed, greed from criminals um, that, that have made this a global business. And, you know, so when I, when I worked at Europol, where I was, uh, the boss for, for nine years, you know, our job was really to try and mobilize the European law enforcement community in different areas. We were also active in fighting terrorism, cybercrime, and so on. In this area, one of the dimensions that I noticed was it wasn't already an established priority. Um, it's not automatically a priority for governments or law enforcement. It's interesting, unlike terrorism or cybercrime, for example. It's interesting because I've worked in, I've looked at the dimension of modern slavery in, in different ways, from, from my work in law enforcement principally, but also in wider government. I worked with Theresa May when she was UK Prime Minister, as a member of her Modern Slavery Task Force. Um, now as a Deloitte partner, you know, working every day with the executives and boards of global business to try and encourage them and help them move to a more responsible business agenda across many different areas, but also in, in this area, we talk about integrity of supply chains, for example. Um, and also my, my work with the Global Fund to End Modern Slavery, where um, we're trying to raise globally $1.5 billion um, so that we can put it to the kind of initiatives that we need in the parts of the world that you've been hearing about from James and, and, and others. Now, I mentioned that sort of those different viewpoints, because there is one com commonality, and I go back to this point about it's not an automatic priority, that, that in, in each of those areas, the political domain, the business domain, um, the law enforcement domain, you know, we have to work hard as a community to get this onto the, onto the front page of their priorities. They have many other things to do as well. And that doesn't happen. Actually, data helps us to, to sell the case, like James says, uh, the powerful stories that Sophie was, was talking and many others, how they speak about, about it. Um, you know, and, and when you hear about Nita's story, you know, th these are emotive stories that should mobilize anyone. But actually, in the end, what makes the difference, like in every other walk of life, is leadership, is where or not there are the people 
in positions of, of influence and authority that will stand up and be counted and change something, do something about this. And you know, we had a Modern Slavery Act in the UK, which is imperfect, but actually pretty good, and has b become a, a best practice model around the world, principally because at that time we had a UK Prime Minister who was personally committed to this goal. You have some business leaders, I won't name them, um, who are personally concerned and taking a stand and doing something mm -hmm. to, to um, clean up the supply chains, for example, and you have mm -hmm. some law enforcement mm -hmm. chiefs as well. But they're few and far between, and it doesn't happen without that leadership commitment. And so as a community, we've got to mobilize and help these leaders to stand up and, and, and be the ones that, that, that will change this forever and, and reach the goal that James is talking about that we so desperately need to get to by 2030. So when you were talking about that it hasn't been a priority, um, that really struck me because I would think we have as, as a global planet um, consensus around some basic ethics and morals and one of that being that slavery is bad um, and, and that we should be doing something about it. So just a question that I'd like to throw open to the whole panel. What do you think is behind that lack of commitment? Is it a lack of political will? Is it lack of resources? What are your thoughts? Should I jump in? Please. Anyone? Well, I think, I think it's partly about emotional distance mm -hmm. that we don't you know, we, we look at that map and we think, oh, the problem's in Africa or Southeast Asia. Over there. But it's not, actually, because, number one, there's modern slavery in every country on Earth. Uh, that's what the evidence tells us. Num number two, the problems that we were just talking about in those countries are feeding our pets, are feeding our supply chains, are feeding the criminal organisations that traffic people from these other countries, from Eastern Europe for exploitation in our own countries. But we've created an ecosystem, as Sophie so eloquently explained, that allows us to keep our emotional distance. It's partly because of the way the supply chain is organized. It's broken up mm. so that the lead firms, the Walmarts, and I, I don't want to single out Walmart, but anybody who's a lead firm at the top of the supply chain doesn't have necessarily direct legal responsibility or command and control over the person at the bottom of the supply chain. But equally as the consumer, we feel a great emotional distance. And I, I think that Rob's point about leadership is really crucial here. But we, we have to work to influence our authorized leaders. But anybody can be a leader. I was struck a couple of days ago, I was talking to somebody in the Congress Center about the similarity between the climate debate and what we want to happen on modern slavery. And that person said to me, I wish we had a Greta, a Greta Thunberg, who is such a powerful communicator, so disciplined and on message. And it struck me that we do. We do have the Gretas in this field. It's people like Sophie and others who are communicating powerfully and eloquently about this. So why are they not getting the, the airtime that someone like mm -hmm. Greta gets. It's partly, frankly, because the media organizations, and there are exceptions like CNN with its Freedom Project, mm -hmm. haven't mm -hmm. taken an interest, don't see a demand for these kinds of stories. But it's also partly because all of us as consumers of those stories are not asking for more stories and not taking the trouble to go and learn the information as we are now beginning to, frankly, mm -hmm. on climate. So. I think we all have a role to play here in that leadership. You don't have to have authority to be a leader, and Greta certainly is a paramount example of that. What she's achieved in such a short time in communicating the importance of this issue is really staggering. Uh, maybe there's a Greta, apart from Sophie, sitting in the audience or watching uh, today. But I would really encourage you after this panel, don't just go away and shake your head and maybe look ruefully at your pet food tonight. <laughs> Take the power in your own hands, learn more about the issue, and think about how you can start advocating in the school for, for slavery-free supply chains mm -hmm. with your bank. Is your bank really sure that it's not banking these criminal organizations that Rob mentioned? with your pension fund I mentioned? Are they investing in firms that have slavery-free supply chain? We all have leadership potential. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think 
again, as we've said, this is, sometimes I feel like this is not a priority because when we go, especially when we go out to communities and we start discussing trafficking and people start thinking about how big of a problem it is and how overwhelming it can become when you think that, and for me, when I started think, when I think about trafficking, and I think about not just trafficking, but going back to also the history of slavery itself, mm -hmm. because I think sometimes it's easy to talk about trafficking and forget about the fact that the term, we are using the term trafficking is because slavery did exist in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there is this, as you are saying, there is this idea of this being such a huge problem, so that it becomes quite overwhelming for people to be able to dissect and ask oh, what can I do as a person and what is my responsibility as an individual. And I think that for us who are advocates and people working in this field is something we need to work on in terms of how do we communicate this huge problem in a way that people understand and can actually be able to pick out the, the things that they can be able to do. In terms of do we need a greater, um, uh, to be honest, I'm an advocate for this issue. One of the things I hate about the development world and how we've basically built, again, a system is this idea that we need to have heroes mm -hmm. or we need to have tokens for people to actually listen especially when it's an issue that involves all of us. Because the truth is, survivors and advocates and people who go through terrible things, people like us who've gone through trauma, basically constantly have to educate, constantly have to teach people. And it's exhausting, to be honest. It's extremely exhausting mm -hmm. for victims and survivors of trafficking to honestly do this work because you constantly have to listen to stories that remind you of things that you didn't want to. I don't believe in tokenism. I think it's wrong to, I think it, it doesn't help anybody because we build a single narrative around an issue. We build a single narrative about what it's supposed to be. And my problem is that single narratives don't help us. They don't address the issue. We need to understand that it's a complex issue. We need to see different people speaking about it. And Greta is amazing. And I'm so glad that one of the things that she's actually also done is highlight some of the different people who were talking about climate change way before Greta. Mm, yes. And the truth is we built a system that also erases the work of activists that have done this work over the years. When it comes to trafficking, there are so many people that have been talking about this is issue over and over again. So also, let's ask ourselves, whose stories do we want to hear? Why do we want to hear stories from certain people and not from certain people? Why is the story appealing to you and uh, when somebody else says it and not appealing to you when another person says it? So for me, for the media, it's more of we don't need a single narrative. We need multiple narratives about this issue because the world is made up of multiple people with multiple identities. It's complex. Let's not be afraid of the complexity. Let's move ahead because it's possible to find out what your personal responsibility is and actually do something. It can be overwhelming, so let's not be afraid of how overwhelming it is, but let's understand that there's simple things. Like right now, just tweeting or writing a message about trafficking won't cost you anything but it could help someone. Being more keen the next time you travel, so the next time you're at an airport and looking around you, just lifting your head and actually looking at the people traveling, traveling with you <coughs> won't cost you anything. Donating to an organization that deals with trafficking, maybe even just when you think about something like $5 or $2, <coughs> it's not much. But it's a lot when you think about it in the context of what work is going to be done. So it's, it's simple. We also need to understand that because we need heroes, we've put such a high price in solving the problem. Mm -hmm. 
because you think that your everyday actions are not heroic, so you don't want to right. do something. So for me, we, if we build a system where we constantly expect heroes to come and rescue us mm -hmm. or heroes to come and fix the problem, what we are essentially also be building is a case for bad situations that require heroes. So we need to stop that. You can be, as you've said, James, anybody here can be a hero, and it doesn't take a lot. It's really very simple and very easy to fix it.